The Journey of Monk Magalana One of the Buddha's Ten Great Disciples. This is a tale of Monk Magalana, one of the Buddha's Ten Greatest Disciples, and his incredible journey of devotion, redemption, and compassion. In Rajgir, a prosperous city within the domain of the ancient kings, resided a rich landowner named Busing. His grand palace was situated on the outskirts of the bustling metropolis. Busing, a benevolent individual, possessed extensive tracts of land and a wide array of livestock, including camels, donkeys, elephants, and horses that roamed the mountains and fields. But Busang's wealth did not come from livestock alone. He also had a warehouse filled with silk, spices, and other valuable goods that he had amassed over the years. And he had lent so much money to others that he had lost count. Despite his immense wealth, Bussing had a friendly disposition and treated everyone with kindness and respect. He was widely known for his generous nature and hospitable demeanor throughout the land. Hosting lavish banquets for the entire village on many occasions and providing an abundance of food to satiate the hunger of the masses. Additionally, he strictly adhered to and practiced Buddha's basic code of ethics which included commitments to abstain from killing living beings, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, and intoxication. However, tragedy struck one day when Bussing fell ill and passed away. His death sent shockwaves throughout the land, and people mourned the loss of such a kind and generous man. Bussang's wife and son, Nabak, were both devastated by the loss of their beloved husband and father, and they grieved deeply. One day, Nabak approached his mother and began to speak. He recounted the past when their family was once extremely wealthy and had an abundance of material possessions. However, since his father's passing, their financial situation has taken a sharp decline. The warehouse that used to be packed with valuable goods was now empty. And their once lavish lifestyle was nothing but a distant memory. In light of this, Nabak proposed using their remaining funds to start a business abroad. After consulting with a financial advisor, he determined they had just enough money to begin. He explained that he had divided their remaining wealth, which consisted of 3,000 boxes of coins, into three parts. Nabak continued, stating that the first portion of the money would be set aside for his mother to ensure their household remained stable. This would allow her to pay for daily necessities, such as food, water, and shelter, and provide her with a comfortable life even in these difficult times. His mother was filled with joy upon hearing this from her dear son. Nabak then explained that the second portion of the money would be used towards aiding the Buddhist community, including organizing a memorial service for his deceased father and all departed souls. His parents had been ardent followers of Buddhism and had instilled in him the values of philanthropy and compassion. Nabak was committed to upholding their legacy by supporting the temple and extending a helping hand to the less fortunate. Upon learning of his plans, Nabak's mother's countenance radiated with a joy akin to the brilliance of the sun. Lastly, Nabak announced that he would take the final portion of the money and use it to start a business in a foreign country. Nabak spent several days packing his belongings. On the day of departure, he bid farewell to his mother with big dreams in his heart. Nabak boarded a ship and set sail. As soon as Nabak had left, his mother went back on her promise to help the Buddhist community, instead doing the complete opposite. She gathered all of the servants and warned them to protect her from any Buddhist monks who might try to preach to her. Her fear and paranoia led her to instruct them to use force, going as far as suggesting hitting the monks with a club if necessary to ensure her safety. Additionally, she began to purchase various animals, such as pigs, sheep, geese, ducks, chickens, and dogs. She instructed the servants to feed them until they were fat and then hung them up on pillars to drain their blood into a tub. The servants were forced to tie up the pigs and beat them with a stick to ensure that their sad cries did not stop. Despite the cruelty of her actions, she found pleasure in sacrificing the animals to the devils with their meat and entrails. As time flowed, three years slipped away, marking a whirlwind of adventure and accomplishment. Nabak embarked on his journey to explore the world and pursue entrepreneurial endeavors. Throughout his travels, Nabak amassed a considerable amount of wealth through his successful business ventures. The money he had earned was not just a measure of his success but also a testament to his hard work, perseverance, and adaptability. He had faced numerous challenges along the way, but his determination and resilience had seen him through. As he made his way back home, 
Nabuk stopped under a beautiful willow tree to rest. The journey had been long and tiring, and he needed some time to reflect and gather his thoughts. He called his servant, Ik Ri, and instructed him to go ahead to his home and inform his mother about his return. Nabuk entrusted his loyal servant, Ik Ri, with a message of great importance to relay to his mother upon his return. He instructed Ik Ri to tell his mother that he had accumulated a large sum of money during his travels. And that he wanted to reward her if she had lived a virtuous life in his absence. He promised to give all the coins to her if she had done many good things while he was away. However, if his mother had made mistakes or acted in ways that were not aligned with her values, Nabuk had a plan in place. He instructed Ik Ri to let his mother know that he would use the money to offer good karma for her soul. Nabuk believed that it was his responsibility to help his mother attain good karma. And that the money would be put to good use in this manner. Nabuk's instructions to Ik Ri showed his deep understanding of the importance of virtuous actions and the consequences of negative actions. He wanted to reward his mother for living a life of integrity and kindness. But he was also prepared to take steps to help her attain good karma if necessary. As Ik Ri left to deliver the message to Nabuk's mother, Nabuk felt a sense of excitement and anticipation. He knew that his mother would be overjoyed to hear of his return and the message he had for her. He also felt a sense of peace, knowing that he had done the right thing by offering a path towards good karma for his mother. Ik Ri dutifully followed his master's orders and made his way to Nabuk's house. As he approached the house, he was spotted by Genji, the servant of Nabuk's mother. Genji immediately recognized Ik Ri and knew that Nabuk must have returned. He hurried to the house to inform Nabuk's mother of the news. Ma'am, Nabuk is back. Genji exclaimed breathlessly as he burst into the house. How do you know? Nabuk's mother asked, her eyes widening with concern. I saw Ik Ri walking towards the house. He must be with Nabuk. Genji replied. Nabuk's mother's heart skipped a beat at the news of her son's return. She knew that she had to act quickly to avoid Nabuk's scrutiny. She was anxious about the possibility of Nabuk discovering the truth and was desperate to prevent him from realizing that she had not been performing the daily memorial service in his absence. With a racing mind, she quickly devised a plan to deceive him. She instructed Genji to lock the door and prevent anyone from entering the house. Meanwhile, she hurried to the storage room and brought out the necessary items for the memorial service. She set them up in the backyard, making it look as if she had been performing the daily ritual all along. Once everything was in place, she allowed Ik Ri to enter the house. She explained to him that she had been performing the memorial service every day in Nabuk's absence. She invited him to see the setup in the backyard to verify her claim. Ik Ri followed her to the backyard and saw the setup for the memorial service. He was impressed by her dedication and sincerity, and he believed that she had indeed been performing the daily ritual. He reported to Nabuk that his mother had been performing the ritual every day in his absence. Upon hearing the stories of his mother's devotion, Nabuk was struck with a sense of deep shame. He had left home and pursued his own ambitions, while his mother had stayed behind and dedicated herself to acts of kindness and selflessness. He vowed to make amends and show his gratitude by performing a thousand prostrations towards his mother, whom he regarded as his benefactor and greatest supporter. As Nabuk began his prostrations, news of his return spread throughout the village, and his neighbors and family members came out to greet him. They were touched by his devotion and commitment, and they eagerly awaited his return to share in the joy of his homecoming. However, they were surprised to see that he remained in a state of deep concentration. Seemingly unaware of his surroundings and fully absorbed in his practice. Curious, his neighbors approached him and asked why he was performing this ritual in front of an empty space. There's no Buddha statue in front of you, and no monks can be seen above. What is the meaning of this prayer? They inquired. Nabuk spoke in a solemn tone as he replied to his neighbor's inquiry. I am filled with shame at the thought of doubting my mother's devotion. I had the smallest inkling of doubt that while she was at home, she may not have offered meals to the monks or performed the necessary memorial services. But my friend Akri informed me of my mistake. In fact, my mother has been most incredibly good. The neighbors answered this by saying, your mother, after you left home when the monks came to the house, 
She chased them away with a stick and told them never to come back. She bought a lot of pigs, goats, geese, ducks, and chickens, and fed them while to fatten them, pub. She tied the goat to a post, bled it, and collected the blood in a pot. She tied up the pig and beat it with a stick, then fried its body in boiling water. The screams from the pig did not stop, and she even cut its belly open, and took out the liver to offer it to the devils, she also indulged in various pleasures. Upon hearing about his mother's brutal actions, Nabuk was overcome with shock and horror. He collapsed to the ground and remained there for an extended period, unable to regain his composure. Blood trickled down his body, and he was left in an unconscious state, deeply affected by the revelation. Upon hearing that her son was coming home, the mother's heart pounded with fear. As she approached the city gates, she could already see her son's figure in the distance, walking towards her at a steady pace. But as he got closer, she noticed that something was wrong. Her son was stumbling, his legs weak and unsteady. Without thinking, the mother rushed forward to catch him, her arms wrapped tightly around his waist. As she held her son, the mother's heart sank she knew that something was seriously wrong, that her son was in great danger. And so she made a vow, a solemn promise to do whatever it took to save him, no matter what the cost. With a stern and determined voice, the mother addressed her son. Listen to my oath, she said. Her words carried a weight and urgency that couldn't be ignored. She drew a comparison to the waves surging on a wide and deep river. Reminding her son that while there may be few who can truly help others succeed, there are many who will instead bring ruin and despair. And then, with a sense of gravity and solemnity, the mother made a vow. If I haven't done daily memorial service after you left, I will die of illness, and enter the worst hell as soon as I return home. Nabuk experienced a surge of relief as his mother's promise reassured him of her steadfast dedication to his welfare, causing his heart to swell. Fueled by a revived sense of optimism and resolve, Nabuk stood up and assisted his mother in doing the same. She grasped him tightly, and together they made their way back home. Soon after they arrived, Nabuk's mother fell ill, just as she had vowed. Despite his best efforts to care for her, her condition continued to worsen until she passed away within a week. Nabuk was devastated by the loss. Nabuk was an extremely dedicated son who went to great measures to pay tribute and maintain the legacy of his mother. He constructed a small hut near her grave and devoted three years to practicing rigorous asceticism, such as trimming fresh grass on her tombstone and reciting Buddhist scriptures during the night. In the daytime, he would bring soil to enhance his mother's tombstone, a gesture of devotion that exemplified his profound affection and admiration for her. Deeply touched by the efficacy of the deceased's life, miraculous events seemed to occur around the gravesite. According to the accounts of witnesses, a deer with nine shining lights was spotted several times in the area as if paying tribute to the departed. Its presence evoked a sense of wonder and awe, as if the deer embodied the essence of the departed soul, still lingering on this earth. Not only that, but a beautiful white crane was also seen visiting the grave, its solemn presence evoking a sense of reverence and respect for the departed. Its graceful movements and pure white feathers seemed to symbolize the purity and innocence of the deceased spirit, as if soaring above the earthly realm towards a higher plane of existence. It is said that the statue of the deceased shed tears from its eyes as if mourning the loss of its mortal existence. The sight of these tears, which appeared to be as pure as crystal, stirred the hearts of all who witnessed it, evoking a deep sense of empathy and compassion for the departed. In addition, various birds were observed helping to gather the earth and make the tomb. It was as if they, too, were paying their respects to the departed and recognizing the importance of this final resting place. As Nabuk stood witness to the miraculous events that occurred around the gravesite, he felt a deep sense of awe and wonder. Filled with a sense of joy and gratitude, Nabuk felt inspired to create a lasting tribute to the deceased. He decided to create a Buddha statue, which he believed would embody the essence of the departed spirit, and serve as a reminder of their life and legacy. With this vision in mind, Nabuk hired a skilled sculptor to bring his vision to life. As the sculptor completed the Buddha statue, a profound sense of closure washed over him. Bidding farewell to his mother's tombstone, Nabuk descended the mountain, carrying with him a newfound peace.
Nabak embarked on a journey to Gurdrakuta Mountain, where Buddha resided, after spending three long years at the grave. Upon his arrival, he paid his respects to the Buddha and sought guidance on his spiritual journey. Nabak shared that he had lost his parents and completed his ordination, expressing his eagerness to follow the Buddha's teachings and become a monk. He inquired about the virtues he needed to cultivate to accomplish this goal. With great wisdom and compassion, the Buddha provided Nabak with guidance that would alter the course of his life. The Buddha explained that assisting another man, woman, or servant in becoming a monk would be more valuable than constructing 84,000 pagodas. In return, Nabak would be blessed with the longevity, health, and prosperity of his living parents. As well as the rebirth of his ancestors up to the seventh generation in the high heaven. The Buddha expounded that if Nabak helped himself in his pursuit of becoming a monk, he would accumulate significantly higher karma. The Buddha's words filled Nabak with a sense of awe and reverence. He understood the gravity of the decision he was making and the profound impact it would have on his life and the lives of those around him. But the Buddha's guidance gave him a sense of purpose and meaning, inspiring him to devote himself fully to the path of enlightenment. At this time, Magallana attained six supernormal powers along with various insights. Although he did not engage in extensive practice in this life, due to his countless past lives of diligent training, he quickly gained insights and supernormal powers. These six supernormal powers are as follows. 1. The power of divine foot, enabling him to travel anywhere within the vast expanse of the three billion universes. 2. The power of divine eye, which enables him to see anything. 3. The power of mind reading, which grants him the ability to discern the thoughts of others. 4. The power of remembering past lives and seeing future lives, allowing him to perceive the cycle of birth and death. 5. The power of clairaudience, granting him the ability to hear all things. 6. Finally, the power of ending the influxes asrava, where mental afflictions and delusions are completely eradicated leading to the realization that one will not be reborn in this world again. The Buddha immediately ordered Ananda to cut Nabak's hair and beard, touched his forehead and renamed him Magallana. Magallana, a devoted disciple of the Buddha, approached his master with a deep desire to pursue the path of enlightenment through the practice of the way. He expressed his intention to leave the Buddha's side and retreat to the mountains to undertake this journey of spiritual discovery. The Buddha, with his all-encompassing wisdom and compassion, responded by advising Magallana to stay with him and practice the way on the mountains in the hermitage. Buddha was asked again by Magallana, How can one practice the way, in the mountains, without anything to eat? Buddha responded, Magallana, in the mountains, there are tigers, deer, various birds and beasts when the time comes. They will bring fragrant flowers for you to taste and eat. After hearing Buddha's words, Magallana tossed his alms bowl into the air and rode it as it soared up into the sky. Soon, he arrived at a temple on Mount Jidrika where he sat down to meditate. Using his left leg to press his right leg and his right leg to press his left leg while supporting his palate with his tongue. As he contemplated the thirty-three heavens, he reached the Nimanarati heaven and saw his father enjoying the blessings of heaven. Magallana then searched for his mother, but he couldn't find her anywhere. Magallana returned from his journey through the heavens, and his mind was heavy with thoughts of his mother. He approached Buddha and told him about the promise she had made to him when she was alive. She had vowed to offer meals to monks and perform daily memorial services. Magallana spoke with sadness in his voice. My mother was a devout and virtuous person, and she fulfilled her promises with sincerity and dedication. With all the good deeds she performed in her life, she should have been reborn in Nimanarati heaven with my father, but I can't seem to find her there. Buddha addressed Magallana and spoke solemnly. Your mother committed grave sins during her lifetime. She did not follow the ways of Buddha and instead harbored greed and malice. Her sins were as vast and numerous as Mount Sumru. So she has been reborn in hell. Upon hearing Buddha's words, Magallana was overwhelmed with grief. 
He could not believe that his mother had committed such grave sins and had been reborn in purgatory. His heart was heavy with sorrow, and he fell to the ground, crying uncontrollably. After some time, Magalana rose to his feet and wiped away his tears. He knew that he had to do everything in his power to help his mother escape the cycle of suffering. He resolved to embark on a journey through the many hells in search of his mother. Magalana's journey was arduous and dangerous, as he encountered many horrors and terrors along the way. He saw countless beings suffering in unimaginable ways, and he could feel their pain and anguish as if it were his own. As Magalana continued on his journey, he came across a particular hell where people were being torn apart. And their blood and entrails were scattered about, causing them to die and revive thousands of times a day. Magalana, with a heavy heart, approached the warden of the hell and asked, What kind of sins did these beings commit in their past lives to deserve such a torment? The warden replied, These beings had committed a heinous act of slaughtering all live animals indiscriminately in their past lives. They would gather around and indulge in a feast of their flesh, severing the taste and reveling in their gluttony. Now they are facing the consequences of their actions and are receiving just punishment. As Magalana continued on his journey, he came across the hell of sword trees. Here, people were being punished by being forced to grasp the sword-like branches of the trees, which would cut through their bodies, causing excruciating pain. In addition, they were made to walk on the sharp blades of the sword trees, causing their limbs to be severed. Filled with sorrow and compassion, Magalana approached the Warden of Hell and asked, What sins did these beings commit in their past lives to deserve such torment? The Warden replied, These beings did not believe in the law of karma in their previous lives. They would seize living creatures and impale them on skewers, roasting them over fires. They would sit around and feast on the flesh, with men and women gathering around to savor the taste and proclaim how delicious it was. Now they have fallen into the hands of justice and are only receiving their just punishment. Magalana continued his journey and came across the hell of crushing stones. In this hell, two giant boulders would crush and grind the bodies of the sinners, causing their flesh and blood to scatter in all directions. Filled with sadness and compassion, Magalana approached the Warden of Hell and asked, What sins did these beings commit in their past lives to deserve such torment? The Warden replied, These beings caused much harm to the ants and insects in their previous lives. Now they have fallen into the hands of justice and are receiving their just punishment. As Magalana continued on his journey, he came across a group of demons. With heads as large as Mount Tai, bellies as large as Mount Sumeru, and throats as thin as needles. They made a sound like the breaking of five hundred carts whenever they walked. Magalana approached them and asked, What sins did you commit in your past lives to deserve such torment? The demons answered, Our sins from past lives include disrespect towards the Buddha and obstructing the offering of alms to the deceased. This has led us to our current state of suffering, where we cannot even hear the name of the Buddha nor enjoy the taste of food. As Magalana journeyed on, he encountered a terrifying place, known as the Sea of Ashes. Here, all beings who had sinned by being cruel to animals were submerged in waves of boiling ash, causing their bodies to burn and wither away. Magalana observed that whenever the East Gate opened, they would desperately rush towards it to escape only for it to abruptly shut as they drew near. The same happened with the west, south, and north gates, providing no respite for their suffering. Feeling sorrowful, Magalana inquired of the warden about the sins of those beings in this hell. The warden replied that they had boiled and consumed eggs in their past lives, hence their punishment in this hell as they were unable to rest even for a moment. Upon continuing his journey, Magalana came across a hell called the Boiling Cauldron where the beings who committed sins related to animal cruelty were boiled alive in a pot of water. Magalana was deeply saddened by this and asked the warden about the sins of those beings in this hell. The warden replied that these beings were from the southern continent and did not believe in the Buddha's teachings. But what was even more heinous was that they were born into wealthy families and consumed all kinds of living creatures, causing immense suffering. 
Therefore, they have fallen into this state of suffering in purgatory. Upon continuing his journey, Magallana came across the hell of burning pots, where beings who had committed sins related to consuming animal bone marrow were punished. These beings had pots of fire placed on their heads, and flames engulfed their skulls. Magallana was deeply saddened by this sight. Despite the hardships he faced, Magallana did not falter. He pressed on, determined to find his mother and bring her to a better place. He searched every corner of hell, asking every soul he met if they had seen his mother. As Magallana continued his journey, he got frustrated that he couldn't find his mother anywhere. He started calling out to his mother in a loud voice. He reminded her of the promise she made to him when she was alive, that she would offer 500 alms daily. And make offerings of incense, flowers, and food according to the teachings of the Buddha. He wondered how she could have possibly ended up in purgatory or even in a place where she couldn't be found, such as heaven. Magallana was deeply saddened by the thought of not being able to meet his mother in the afterlife. As the 84,000 guards in the hell prison heard a voice calling for a mother, they looked at each other and spoke. We can hear the voice of a live person. It must be prisoners sent from the southern continent. I will take an iron bar, pierce their chest, and bring them here, said one of them. At that moment, Magallana was standing in front of the gate of hell. Suddenly, he had a realization and entered into a state of meditative absorption. The warden called out to him several times, but Magallana didn't respond. When he finally came out of the meditative state, the warden asked him who he was and why he was standing there. Magallana replied calmly, Please do not be angry with me, I am here to find my mother. The warden was surprised and asked, Who told you that your mother is here? Magallana answered, the Buddha told me that my mother is here. The warden asked another question. What is your relationship with the Buddha? Magalana answered. He is my teacher, and I am his disciple, Magalana. The warden and his guards were deeply moved by Magalana's words, and their emotions overwhelmed them. They dropped to their knees and bowed down repeatedly, praising him for his close relationship with the Buddha. The act you are doing is kind and virtuous. As a fellow Buddhist, I am honored to see the face of one of Buddha's disciples today. However, I am not aware of your mother's name. I will go to the office to check the records for you, the warden said. After searching the records in the office, the warden couldn't find any information about the name. He then recommended to Magalana. There is a hell called the Abyssi that you can check. Maybe you will find some information there. As Magallana continued his journey, he encountered a massive hell. The walls were as high as 10,000 lengths, and the black walls were layered with a thousand layers. The walls were covered in iron mesh, and on top of it were four large bronze hellhounds. Flames constantly spewed out of their mouths and rose high into the sky. Magallana suspected that he had reached a Vici hell, but he couldn't find a way in. He began to shout and call out, but no one answered. Magallana returned to the warden and asked, There is a huge hell ahead, with walls as high as 10,000 lengths and black walls, with a thousand layers, covered in iron mesh. I shouted a thousand times, but no one answered. Can you tell me what it is? The warden replied, It is because your spiritual power is not strong enough. The only way to open the gate is to ask the Buddha for permission. Upon hearing this, Magallana threw his alms bowl into the air and ascended on it towards where the Buddha was. He informed the Buddha, Venerable one, I went to a large hell, with walls as high as 10,000 lengths and black walls as thick as 10,000 folds. But no matter how many times, I shouted loudly, no one answered. The Buddha replied, You must grasp my staff with twelve linked chain, wear my robe, and take my alms bow to the gate of that hell. Shake the staff three times, and the gate will open automatically. The lock will fall off, and all the sinners inside will have a brief respite upon hearing the sound of the chain. Upon receiving the staff and wearing the Buddha's robe, Magallana held the alms bowl in his hand and approached the gate of hell. He shook the staff three times, and the gate opened on its own, with the lock falling off. Magallana rushed inside the hell, 
but the guards tried to push him out and questioned how he was able to open the gate that had been closed for many years. Magalana asked the warden, If the gate is not opened, how do the sinners enter? The warden replied, The southern continent people commit many acts of unfilial piety, misunderstand the teachings of the Bata, and do not believe in Buddhist scriptures. After their death, they are blown by the winds of karma and hung upside down when they arrive here. They do not enter through the gate. The warden asked him why he came to that place. Magalana replied that he came to search for his mother. The warden then asked who told him that his mother was there. Magalana explained that it was the Buddha who had informed him. When the warden asked about Magalana's relationship with the Buddha, he explained that the Buddha was his teacher. The warden requested the name of Magalana's mother and went to the office to check the records. Magalana revealed that his mother's name was Lady Yuhesa, the wife of a high, ranking official named Busing. After this, the warden entered hell and called out for Lady Yuhesa. No one answered. When the warden called Yuhesa for the second or third time, a worried woman approached the warden with an anxious expression on her face. He asked if she had a son named Magalana who was a disciple of the Buddha. The warden told her that there was a chance for her to leave hell soon, as Magalana had a strong connection with the Buddha. Afterwards, the warden inquired why Lady Yuhesa did not respond. She was hesitant to answer and cause any further trouble for herself, fearing that she might be sent to an even worse hell. She explained that she had only one son, who was not a monk named Magalana. The warden then relayed this information to Magalana, who said, Please do not trouble yourself trying to recognize me as their son. My name was Nabok, when my parents were alive. But after they passed away, I became a monk under the Buddha, and attained enlightenment, and my name was changed to Magalana. The warden asked Magalana, If I help you find your mother today, how will you repay our kindness in the future? Magalana replied, If I am able to meet my mother today, I will request the help of many bodhisattvas and recite the Mahayana Sutras to repay your kindness. The warden went back into hell and said to Lady Yuhesa, I will help you find joy. The person who came to the gate is your lost child, Nebok. Yuhesa replied, If he is Nebok, then he is the child I once held in my arms. The warden then used a sharp iron bar to pierce Yuhesa to lift her out, causing her to bleed profusely. Next, he enclosed Yuhesa's body in an iron cage and sent her out to reunite with her son. Finally, turning to Magalana, the warden posed a question. Do you recognize your mother? Magalana replied, I'm afraid, I cannot recognize her. Then the warden said, The person engulfed in flames before us is indeed your mother. Upon closer inspection, Magalana recognized his mother and cried out, Mother, it is you. Mother, it's really you but why? Why have you changed like this? It must have been very painful. Why did you do that, mother? You said that when you were alive. You made offerings of five hundred bowls of food and flowers every day, in accordance with the Dharma, and that you should have ascended to the Nimanarati heaven based on that karma. Why are you not in the Nimanarati heaven, but rather in hell? I always offer delicious food for your soul during my meals, so why do you look so emaciated? Mother called out to Magalana and said, My dear son, I was worried that I would never see my son again. But how did we happen to meet today at the gate of hell? This mother is suffering terribly in hell. When I am hungry, I eat iron scraps. When thirsty, I drink copper juice. She could barely finish speaking when the guards appeared and stabbed her with a long, hot iron causing her entire body to burn in flames. At that moment, the sinners in the same hell began to speak to one another. Why do they get to reunite while we have no chance of leaving? The warden addresses Magalana. You can't speak with your mother for too long. It's time for her to return to her punishment. If you don't release her now, I will pierce her chest with an iron rod and take her back to punishment. As Magalana releases his mother, she is dragged back into hell by the warden. She screams out, My beloved son, my dear son, I am suffering greatly. Please use all your power to save me. Unable to bear his mother's cries, 
Magalana bangs his head against a pillar until blood and flesh gush out. He then tells the warden, I will take my mother's punishment in her place. The warden responds, Your mother's sin is too grave, and nothing can interfere with her punishment. If you wish for her release from hell, you must appeal to the Bata. Magalana hears these words and throws himself into the air, soaring up to the place where the Buddha resides. He circles the Buddha three times, asking, O oh, venerable sir, my mother is suffering unbearable pain in hell. How can I rescue her and help her escape from this hell? The Buddha replies, Magalana, I will save your mother. Magalana asks, Can you really save her? The Buddha responds, If I cannot save your mother, I will run into hell myself and take her place in suffering for a long time. At this moment, the Buddha was surrounded by countless beings, including gods and humans, as well as various supernatural beings. He then dispersed his body into the air, soaring to a height of seven tala trees, with everyone following him. The Buddha emitted light of five colors from his forehead, which shattered the walls of hell. The iron cage hell turned into a lotus seat, the hell of swords turned into a staircase made of white jade and the hell of boiling liquid turned into a pond of fragrant water. At that instant, King Yama praised, Truly good, truly good. Now I am able to personally worship and offer incense to the Bhatta. Who can still doubt the existence of Bhatta in this world? Saying this, he commanded the guards to release all sinners and allowed them to ascend to heaven. As Magalana inquires again to the Buddha, all the sinners have been reborn in heaven. But where is my mother? The Buddha responds, Your mother's sins in her past life were grave and unpardoned, and her karma was not fully purified. Therefore, she came out of the great hell, but was later sent back to the black abyss hell. I will give you a bowl of rice that was left over from the offerings of all the bodhisattva." Go to hell and offer it to your mother. Magalana brings the bowl of rice to offer it to his mother in hell. But when she sees the food, her desire and hunger overpower her. She clenches the rice with her left hand and uses her right hand to block others from taking it. However, as soon as she puts the rice in her mouth, it transforms into flames just like before. Magalana asks the Buddha, How can I release my mother from the black abyss hell? The Buddha responds, To release your mother from the black abyss hell, you must invite all the bodhisattvas to learn and recite the Mahayana Sutras. Following the Buddha's instructions, Magalana invites all the bodhisattvas and diligently studies and recites the Mahayana Sutras. As a result, his mother is released from the black abyss hell but is reborn in the realm of hungry demons. Magalana asks the Buddha again, it has been a long time since my mother went to hell. I want to see my mother in the underworld and give her water to drink to refresh her. The Buddha replied, If all the Buddhas drink the water, it is like good mill. If all the gods drink the water, it is like sweet dew. If the ten virtuous people drink the water, they can relieve their thirst. But if your mother drinks the water, it will turn into a fierce fire in her belly and burn her intestines. Magalana asked again, Then, how can my mother leave the body of the hungry demon? The Buddha responded, You must implore all the bodhisattvas to light forty-nine lamps and release many lives in the mountains and sea. This way, your mother will be able to break free from the grip of the hungry demon. Magalana followed the Buddha's orders without delay, seeking the help of all the bodhisattvas, lighting forty-nine lamps, and releasing numerous lives in the mountains. Finally, his mother was able to break free from the clutches of the hungry demon. With a heavy heart, Magalana asked the Buddha about his mother's whereabouts after her escape from the demon's world. The Buddha revealed to him that with the aid of divine intervention, his mother had successfully broken free from the demon's clutches. However, she had been reborn as a female dog in the city of Rajgir. 
The news of his mother's rebirth as an animal hit Magalana like a ton of bricks, causing his heart to sink. He couldn't help but feel an overwhelming sense of sadness as he heard that his mother had been reborn into a life considered to be of a lower being. Upon hearing the Buddha's words, Magalana went to the city of Rajgir with his bowl and set out to find his mother. When he arrived, he was greeted by a female dog who rushed towards him and embraced him. With divine power, Magalana was able to communicate with the dog's mind. She said, You are my son and I am your mother. Magalana was overjoyed to hear his mother's voice and asked her how she was coping in her new form as a dog. He wondered how her current state compared to her suffering in the demon's world. The female dog replied that even though she was now trapped in the form of a dog and forced to eat unclean things, she still preferred this life to the constant torture and agony she had suffered in the demon's world. She added that she was terrified of the thought of returning to that place ever again. Magalana then asked the Buddha, How can my mother escape from this form of a dog and be reborn into a higher form? The Buddha responded to Magalana's question, If you perform a memorial service for all the deceased beings on the fifteenth day of the seventh lunar month, your mother will be able to break free from her current form as a dog. Magalana asked the Buddha, Why must we choose the fifteenth day of the seventh lunar month? Why not the thirteenth or fourteenth day? The Buddha provided an explanation to Magalana regarding the significance of the fifteenth day of the seventh lunar month. He explained that this was a special day when all the monks emerged from their deep 100-day meditation sessions. As the monks had lifted spirits and were in a state of heightened spiritual awareness, their prayers and good deeds could have a powerful impact on the dead beings. According to Buddhist beliefs, the actions and intentions of the living can have an effect on the spiritual realm, particularly the realm of the dead. Therefore, the Buddha advised Magalana to take advantage of this special day and gather with others to offer prayers and good deeds for the deceased. By doing so, they could create positive energy and merit that would benefit not only the dead but also themselves. The Buddha emphasized the importance of sincerity and purity of intention in performing these actions, as it is the heart that ultimately determines the outcome of one's actions. Magalana was grateful for the Buddha's advice and resolved to make the most of this special day. To offer prayers and perform good deeds for his mother's benefit. He realized that by following the Buddha's teachings and practicing good deeds, he could help his mother break free from her current form and attain a higher rebirth. Magalana promptly followed the Buddha's instructions and went to the market to buy birch leaves and pine branches to offer the memorial service on the 15th day of the 7th lunar month. As a result, his mother was able to leave her dog form and appeared before the Buddha to receive the 500 precepts. Magalana prayed that his mother could let go of any lingering resentment and return to the right path. Moved by Magalana's filial piety, the heavens were stirred, and his mother was welcomed to heaven, where she enjoyed every pleasure. After his mother found happiness, Magalana dedicated the rest of his life to saving countless sentient beings by preaching the Dharma. The main point of the Dharma is that if a filial son or daughter writes out this sutra and recites it for their parents, their three generations of parents and seven generations of ancestors will attain liberation and enjoy long life and good fortune. After the Buddha finished his sermon, the dragon kings, eight groups of divine beings, and other heavenly beings were delighted and pledged to faithfully carry out the practice of this sutra. They made their offerings and departed. Among the ten disciples of Buddha, one of them, Magalana, entered hell to save his mother who had fallen into it. Eventually, he succeeded in attaining the state of bliss for his mother. This story became the basis for the creation of one of the five major Buddhist festivals called, Ulambana, celebrated on the 15th day of July. The term, Ulambana, is derived from the Sanskrit word, Ulambana, which means, hanging upside down. It symbolizes the suffering of the souls of the deceased who are hanging upside down in the realm of hungry ghosts, experiencing great pain. Even today, Ulambana festivals are celebrated in countries like Korea, Thailand, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Taiwan. In particular, in Korea, it is recorded that during the 12th century, especially in the first year of the reign of King Yu Young, 
special rituals and dharma assemblies were held to pray for the well-being of King Sukjong and his entry into heaven. 